Hi, everybody. Uh, long waiting for you to join us. Uh, hope you get a drink because it's been a really long week. Please, please do. The, the taxes yeah. story was just last week, and apparently there's fewer than 30 days left until the election. Yeah, like and 20. Well, there was, there's another part of the tax story which came out today. Did you see that? About the illegal <laughs> loan that he gave himself in 2016? I don't know, man. Like, it's just like, you know, you read about Teapot Dome in high school and you're like, nobody could ever do anything that dumb ever again. And then you read about Watergate and you're like, no one can do anything e that dumb ever again. And then like you live through the past four years and you're like, whoa, I now yeah. understand how people during Watergate felt like this was really, really sad, but also like really infuriating. Yeah. Word. Yep. <laughs> and with that, thank you for joining us. Have a great night. So. <laughs> yes. Uh, so today, anyway. uh, yeah. So today, I'm happy to introduce Benjamin Railton, who is a professor at Fitchburg State. Uh, he teaches in uh, American Studies and English, right, and liter huh? and literature. Yeah, yes. and you know he has his PhD from Temple University. And his most recent book is on history and hope in American literature, um, but also he's been working on memory and American memory and how all that works. And I'm really excited to talk about that because I think that's one of the most difficult things about understanding uh, American history is how basically everybody forgets everything really quickly and it constantly changes everything. And so like the book is, is called of D.I. Singh. It's like the contested history of American patriotism. So I'm interested to talk about because we've had a lot of big talk about patriotism for the past mm. couple of weeks. So yeah. yeah. All right. So first Thanks. question, of course, is Ben, what are you drinking? All right. Well, I, I put an inordinately nerdy amount of thought into that question. Um, perhaps <laughs> an appropriately nerdy amount of thought. And a lot of my recent work is about dualities in America, two different sides of America, patriotism, things like that. So I decided I was going to double fist it with beer. Um, two sides. And so one side is Sam Adams, which is sort of like the celebratory, uh, you know, somewhat white supremacist narrative of American history, let's be honest. And then the other side is um, Modelo, which I've never had before, uh, Mexican American beer. <laughs> it's pretty good. It's pretty good. So this is the contested history of 2020 beer and American patriotism and identity in a, a double fisted beer drinking. I'd, I'd love it. I love it. It is not as creative as my drink, which is just all I'm having is Willet bourbon again, because this is like one of my favorite bourbons. And uh, I sat down and I was like, what do I want to drink after this year of a week? And it's, it's bourbon. Yeah. Fair enough. So in, in virtually you keep saying that like you're, you're not fancy, but that is the fanciest fucking bottle like I have ever seen. Such and a I mean, fancy bottle. On. So it's called I mean, Willet yeah. pot still, and it is in the shape of a still like, I love it. But my Modelo has a gold thing around the top, so. <laughs> I know, I mean, like, we're, you're just you're just classing everything up, right? I mean, this is ridiculous. Like, we're just, we're terrible. Yeah. So um, I don't have anything particularly fancy. I, I just, like Barsha, like, I just have some bourbon today. I have some Woodford, um, which is just kind of my go-to bourbon for mixing and, um, and, and for straight drinking. It's, I think it's important for bourbons like that you want something that can work both ways. Yeah. Like you don't, you want to be able to make, you know, mix it and make cocktails with it, but you also want to be able to drink it straight. And there's sometimes that you buy a bourbon, which is great for mixing, but you just really don't want to drink it by itself. <coughs> Sorry, coronavirus. Um, but, uh, but actually, um, <laughs> I don't have, I don't have, I don't have coronavirus. Um, <coughs> I just drank too much bourbon too quickly. Sorry. Um, yeah. But anyway, so this is the gods punishing me for making fun of cheap bourbon because cheap bourbon has its place. So I do want to, uh, if I could take the first question for, for our guest, for Ben, is, um, you know, I, I, I remember Sam Adams, like, growing up, is that, like, Sammy's were because I grew up in the Northeast, in upstate New York, close enough to, to, to New England that, that, that Sammy's uh, were, were. I don't thing. know if it's close but enough to New York, but we'll allow it. <laughs> It's not actually New England because I'm still a Yankees fan and, you know, whatever, but um, I would never claim New England. No, I'm not, I'm too proud and too, I respect myself too much to, to say that. Um, but, uh, but I remember Sam Adams too, being part of the, uh, the beer summit. 
um, the famous beer summit for um, with uh, when Obama and Henry Louis Gates and the police officer, like, which was just this this kind of crazy thing. And one of the things I'm going somewhere with this, I promise. Uh, one of the things that 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 came out right is that Obama kind of called that beer summit. President Obama called that beer summit because he was because of his criticism of what we know was kind of the unjust handling, the arrest of Henry Louis Gates outside of his own home. Right, but but that led to a lot of calls, if I'm remembering correctly, of him being un-American. Right, is that criticizing the pre, uh, police? That's something that isn't patriotic. Now, as an expert and someone who talks about patriotic history, like how is that? Like, has the police have the the the, the police always been kind of a core component of what we think of as? American, and I'm thinking too now of the kind of ubiquitous, and maybe less so now than than in the past, ubiquitous American flags with blue stripes, right? right? That there's a there's an elision that's sort of happening between policing and kind of kind of patriotism. Like, is is that something that you've run into in kind of in your own work? Yeah, and it also is. just a more of a tongue in cheek question to build on that: Have the Americans ever questioned authority? Just, just like, <laughs> has that ever been? an aspect of our patriotic history of questioning authority. So, yeah. It, it, it has, it really has. And and so just two quick things about those two good and somewhat interconnected questions anyway. One, part of the whole reason I wanted to write about this was to push back on just the one vision of patriotism that is so frequently what we talk about. If I was gonna sort of sum up my last couple projects, it's basically that Raymond Carver short story, what we talk about when we talk about love I think there's sort of what we talk about when we talk about patriotism, what we talk about when we talk about America. There's these sort of assumed narratives a lot of the time. Even those of us who would challenge them often kind of give in to those assumptions and maybe say, okay, well, that's not us then. We're not that, so we're just critical of this thing, rather than recognizing that there are alternatives. There's other forms. So, I mean, my whole argument in this book is that critical patriotism has been around for our whole history. So absolutely, mm -hmm. we've challenged authority, and in fact, we've done so in really overtly patriotic ways, critical patriotic ways. But the problem is we don't remember those histories to go back to what you were saying about memory, Varsha. We remember much better the kind of celebratory mythic patriotisms, that legacy, those, those rituals, those performances. So that's part of it is we just don't remember that consistent presence, that history of critical patriotism. And then to go to your question, Matt, I would say somewhat yes, um, authority in a variety of levels and, and the sort of hierarchy of authority has been built into that that sort of celebratory patriotism that we, you know, support the troops, that we, you know, respect the blue, that we respect the, these communities. But yeah. again, if we remember other histories, it opens up all sorts of other ways to think about those things. So during World War One, for example, or right after World War One in 1919, there's this police strike in a lot of cities in the nation, including Boston. Um, and at, at the time of the Boston police strike, oh, there's newspapers around the country calling for those striking policemen to not only be fired, but to lose their citizenship, arguing that they are they are so unpatriotic, they are so outside of the national uh, narrative that they need to lose their American citizenship as, mm. as striking police officers. So that's a community, that's a moment we could recover that would point in a really different direction than just the kind of authoritarian, celebratory, patriotic narrative. So a lot of the time it has played into that, but there are other histories in there that are worth remembering too. I have a question building on that, building on memory. Um, one thing that I've seen lately, and it's like really bumped up a lot in like the past like few years or so is the whole anytime um, somebody who is more liberal will point to something being undemocratic or this is not how we do things in a democracy, the canned response from very unserious or people claiming to be serious people is we're not a democracy, we're a republic. And recently a Senator went like really far in making that point. Um, I just like, I don't know if people, I don't know if people saw it because it was like a really scary tweet. Um, but basically he said like democracy, Senator Mike Lee said democracy is not the objective. Um, and that the objective is liberty, peace and prosperity. And we want the human condition to flourish and rank democracy and thwart that. And, and the reason I asked this question is that people who ask this aren't trying to be like, oh, the founding fathers were really afraid of the tyranny of the majority. But there's like another reason they're using, you know, this, we're not a democracy or a republic rhetoric. And I was wondering if, if you had any work on that, on like how ideas about democracy feed into patriotism. Yeah, and I think, I mean, the simplest answer, and I was talking about this earlier, actually in an adult learning class where we're thinking about these patriotism questions too, 
is that power in America for pretty much all of our history, to me, has been associated with these particular answers to these questions. So a more white supremacist, exclusionary definition of America, a more celebratory patriotism, those things have aligned with our, our most powerful forces much of the time. Um, our power structure, our hierarchy, our elites a lot of the time. And so I think that's partly where these narratives come from is this, is this continued identification with that power structure and with the, the way that power structure has worked in a lot of ways to push particular narratives at the expense of other communities in America. And so again, part of why I try to, to open up alternatives is that those things have never actually represented America to me. Um, I mean, no one other than the most Kool-Aid drinking Trump supporters would say the government equals America right now, right? There's other parts of America, there's other communities, there's, there's all, all that is a part of us. But for a lot of the way we tell the story of the past, it is kind of the government, the power yeah. structure, the presidents, the faces mm -hmm. on the elementary school wall, the kind of the, and if you buy into that, that narrative that the sort of power structure equals America, then America is a bunch of things. If you're critical of it, it is just white supremacist and exclusionary. And if you're a supporter of it, then it is this kind of elite uh, power structure to be aspired to and worshiped rather than, than seen critically. So I do think I've been into that idea of how we define these things. And if we do that in this very particular way from either angle, we end up just reinforcing that idea that the power structure is who we are rather than a tiny piece and not really a representative piece of who we are. Yeah. I really like that, so, like accepting the fact that the power structure is not everything that is meant to be American. Mm. Yeah, but I think there, I think there's a tendency, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, right, in that we're talking about kind of the abstract concepts like like patriotism, and I really liked how you put a modifier on patriotism earlier, critical patriotism, right, and because I th there's there's there seems to be um, um, a tendency, and, and for very understandable reasons, to want to simplify, and to attach kind of a, 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 a allegiance to a country to a symbol, so to a flag. Right or to a government or something like that. So, are there are there other models that we can look to either historically or kind of in in, in other parts of the world or something like that when we're talking about like respect and and understanding that the, there is something valuable about this particular nation that we we find ourselves in by sometimes by accident of birth or by choice, um, but at the same time to recognize that it's 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 a messy it's a messy relationship that we as individuals are going to have with that. There is. And one of the differentiations I try to make in order to do that, because a big part of my goal is reclaiming the possibility of patriotism for, for critical voices and for progressive voices and, mm -hmm. and those of us who, who too often just do cede it over to uh, those, those one answers, those one definite. And so part of it is to differentiate, I would say, between nationalism and chauvinism and patriotism. Mm -hmm. That there are ways to sort of embrace the country that are really authoritarian ultimately and really us versus them. And I would call those that combo of nationalism and chauvinism, that we are the best, you, uh, my country right or wrong, those kinds of narratives. Mm. But to me, patriotism, if we allow for critical and active and other forms, it doesn't have to do that at all. Th those are possibilities, but there's other possibilities that are not nationalist or chauvinistic to me in those ways. And so an example would, I mean, I do think we have, we have models here if we think of figures and communities and efforts as, as patriotism rather than just the symbols. And so a great example that I was just talking about again earlier today are the Japanese American soldiers who fought in World War II, uh, many of them mm -hmm. out of the internment camps. Um, like that to me is an example of an incredibly patriotic moment. Um, and any of these figures were also critical of the nation. They were not just blindly allegiant, certainly their, their communities weren't, but they still embodied that best version of, of the America that they wanted to serve and sacrifice for, despite being, again, the power structure excluding them so fully and so legally at that moment. So I think there are figures, there are communities that we can highlight if we set aside the nationalist and, you know, and, um, and chauvinistic sides of the, of the definition. So, so I like the distinction that you're drawing right between nationalism and patriotism, that they're, they're absolutely different things and you should all go out and buy this book um, to, to read more about that. So oh, we're all about shameless plugs. But my question, which maybe is a little bit, no, it's not out of left field, it's my show, whatever. We can do whatever we want, is what is the most nationalistic movie that you can think of and is it a Mel Gibson movie? <laughs> um... No, I, I, the most nationalistic movies I think of are not Mel Gibson, although he is, he is obviously in the conversation. Okay. 
um, I think uh, I think Red Dawn comes to mind. Red Dawn is a crazy nationalistic movie. Um, the 80s one. I haven't seen the remake. I don't know if the remake's any good. The 80s one. Yeah, don't, was, like don't, every young don't actor that. in Hollywood at the time. Um, yeah. I, right. I think I think Top Gun is an incredibly mm. nationalistic movie. Um, you know, it's, it's literally sort of about this kind of like right amongst themselves kind of together um so i think i think the 80s was big on on these nationalistic uber patriotic sort of end of the cold war kind of movies and i think top gun and red dawn both come to mind as again just sort of expressing this visceral love this visceral love that yeah. that can't be questioned or even really analyzed because it falls apart if you analyze it for a second um either of those movies do but that's not the goal the goal is just to yeah. feel it so viscerally that's really what interesting are... because i mean Sorry, if, if I could just follow up, sorry, Varsha, just for really briefly is that, you know, my, my first reaction, like it makes total sense when you say that, but like my first reaction, if someone were to ask me that, and, and again, I'm like a simple medievalist, so I don't, I don't know anything after 1200, but is, um, is to think of something like from the 40s or 50s, right? But then right. kind of you think a little bit more about it, like maybe the like kind of a John Wayne movie or something sure. like that. But even then they're like, they're, there's something, there's something a little bit more critical maybe kind of going on than this kind of Reagan era um, kind of macho Cold War Americanism. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I think it uh, uh, just quickly, I mean, you just look at like the evolution of Rambo, mm -hmm. right, uh, of this character who is a, you know, a Vietnam vet who is so critical of the system. And then two movies later, he is literally wearing like the American flag headband yeah. um, and, you know, shooting down Russian helicopters with an arrow. Right. I mean, just yeah. like the way that character gets co-opted in the 80s so fully out of that incredibly complicated, critical, messy starting point, I think is kind of reflective of where that decade went in those narratives. Yeah. But first, oh, you're... I had a question, like, what are the what are the movies you think about that like exhibit this critical patriotism? Because oddly enough, and I am not a fan of Clint Eastwood or this movie, but oddly enough, when you first asked about the movie question, Matthew, I immediately thought of Flags of Our Fathers mm -hmm. because I mm. saw that movie and I was like, I saw that movie and I still wanted to be a U.S. citizen, but I was like, damn, the U.S. like sucks. So I was just wondering if there are like other examples that you can think of. Yeah, and I mean, I would say, you know, I definitely have soured on Clint over the years, but in the same year that he made that movie or the same time he made Letters from Iwo Jima, and, and you know, which mm -hmm. is the, the same battles from the Japanese perspective. And I would say that combination is a really great reflection of a more critical perspective, right? That he's willing to say, you know, there's this other this other narrative here, and let me try to delve into it in a serious way and a respectful way with Japanese actors and Japanese American actors. And I thought I thought that was a really impressive choice. And then to me, I mean, I, I have a whole list of favorite movies. I would say too quickly. I think Glory is a great example of both active and critical patriotism. Just the service and sacrifice of those figures, of those real uh, U.S. colored troop soldiers and 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 officers. Um, is active patriotism to me really embodied the commitment again even to a nation that was so blatantly discriminatory as the movie highlights so well um, to still embody that best version I think that to me is, is active patriotism and then critical patriotism I have a lot but I always have to go back to uh, John Sayles who's my favorite American filmmaker mm -hmm. my favorite director and I think a lot of his movies explore these questions of American identity um, in ways that are critical but ultimately still have hope a lot of the time and, and my favorite one of his is Lone Star, which is about the border, the, the Texas and, and Mexico border, but also just about the sort of whole history of America, the worst version of it, the white supremacist version of it, but then what's underneath, all these communities, all these families that are interconnected, that ultimately are literally and figuratively related to each other in this place. So I think all sales stuff is really critical patriotic. Uh, Mate Juan is another really good example about the West Virginia coal mining wars of the 1920s. I just love all his stuff for that reason. So that's really interesting, too, because I mean, like the way that you, you know, the, the first several movies that we were talking about, like all revolve around war. Yep. And so and, and I think that's another thing, like even more than the police kind of is, is about the military and it's as kind of a, a, an avatar for American um, uh, either patriotism or nationalism, kind of, I guess, kind of depending. Um, but the stories that tell, um, you know, I don't want to get to Q&A so uh, so quickly, but something like uh, Rocky Four. Right, is, is there's nationalism and patriotism which are which are manifested in so many different ways, and the John Sayles stuff is so great because it tells these other stories about kind of like you said, like everyday lives, and you know not everybody is going to serve in the military. In fact, 
as we've seen from polls, right, the number of percentage of Americans who have family members serving in the military is declining very precipitously. Um, so, but we still kind of hold these things up. So, so it's really interesting to kind of think outside of those normal parameters. And if you, you do start to think about it for just a minute, it, it makes a lot of sense, right? That, that, that there's other ways to express kind of um, concern or care for, um, for the country. So, right? so I guess my question is, and I don't know, it, it might be too easy of, an, of a question, but has American patriotism always based, based itself on exclusion or is that just nationalism, right? Like, I know they go hand in hand, but like, has, has the definition of the United States always been in opposition to what other people are not? Or is there a positive definition of the United States or Americanism or America? Yeah, the latter for me, really the latter, just like I said about patriotism, not wanting to cede it over to just this one answer, just this one definition. Um, my prior book, We the People, which is about definitions of American identity, is the same duality, exclusion and inclusion. And my argument there is that we find those in every historical moment. Um, and But we have to broaden, again, like look beyond the power structure. So the revolution is an example for me. If we look at just the framers, just the founding fathers, even at their best, um, they certainly include a lot of that exclusion, a lot of that hierarchy, that white supremacy, um, those, the, what if we expand who we consider founders to think about um, somebody like Elizabeth Freeman here in Massachusetts who uses the Massachusetts state constitution and the language and ideals of the declaration to successfully argue for her own freedom and basically contribute to the end of slavery in Massachusetts um, in the 1780s during the revolution still. What if we see her as a founding mother, as a founding figure, why not? These are narratives, these are memories, we can define them however we want. And those figures have always been there, those histories have always been there. So. Absolutely, I think we've had inclusion and that, that vision all along. And similarly, we've had critical patriotism all along. You have somebody like um, Abigail Adams, again, here in Massachusetts, writing to John. The famous phrase we always remember is uh, from this letter is when she says, remember the ladies. But she goes further when she writes to him and she says, and if you don't, if the lawmakers who are creating this new declaration and code of laws don't remember the ladies, she says, we, will, we are determined to foment a rebellion and to express ourselves like we will have our own revolution. Like that's critical savage. patriotism at that moment. It is savage, it's, it's phenomenal. And, and so absolutely we have these other answers at each, at each stage, but our collective memories really often, you know, what we talk about when we talk about American patriotism are often just the one answer, just the one version, even if we're critical of it. And so we leave aside these other possibilities. So, so how do you teach this? Right, like you were mentioning, like you teach an adult um, adult learning class, and you know, you, I'm sure you teach um, undergraduates at at, at Framingham State. Like, like, how do you convey this to to a class of students? Um, you know, especially who are coming through the American high school system, in which they have a certain type of not necessarily because of any kind of certainly not of any fault of any teachers or anything like that, but but because of the way the textbooks, for example, are structured and the stories that that are kind of baked into that into the kind of how we think about kind of American history. And I think, yes, absolutely, it, it, that's my day to day is, and I actually think about public scholarship as, as just another version of teaching because teaching is about conversation. It's not just about me just imparting ideas, obviously. So similarly, public scholarship is about conversation and community. And I think what we're all really trying to do in, in all those settings, at least I know what I am, is provide sort of access to these stories and these texts and these voices, rather than just say, I know everything that we need to say about them already. I have my opinions and I'm happy to share them while drinking uh, better and worse beer. The Modelo is not great, I have to say. I'm sorry, Modelo. But, um, but it's not just about that, right? It's ultimately about providing the opportunity to talk about these things together. So just an example of that, 100% of the time, the favorite author when I teach American Lit 1, the first half of the survey, 100% of the time is uh, William Apes or Apesh, it's pronounced sometimes this, a Native American Methodist orator, author, essayist uh, minister in the 1820s and 1830s um, who just writes these incredible essays. There's one called An Indian's Looking Glass for the White Man, which is this very sarcastic, mm -hmm. ironic, angry um, uh, refusal of white supremacy and the Indian removal era, and then hopeful argument about community. And then even better than that is this one called A Eulogy on King Philip, which is, uh, he claimed King Philip as an ancestor on his maternal side, the Wampanoag mm -hmm. chief who the 1670s war was named after. And Apes says, what if we think about King Philip as a revolutionary American ancestor for all of us, 
not just for the Wampanoag or Native people, but for all Americans. And his, I mean, he's just, he's brilliant, he's funny, he's biting, he's hopeful. And 100% of the time, he's the favorite figure. And I just give him to students to talk about. I don't have to say all of that. I don't say all of that. It's about having him in front of us and then talking about him together. So I think that's, again, it's all there. These histories, these stories are there. And yes, textbooks often can't or don't or choose not to highlight a lot of them. But we can, we certainly can. And the more we do that, I think the more impossible it is not to have the conversations anyway, not to engage these histories and stories. Yeah. I think you're exactly right. It's not just about changing the aspect of, or like the perspective of lectures or even the whole curriculum. It's really about the one thing you learn in grad school on like day one, regardless of the field you're in in humanities is like, go back to the primary source right like go to your primary source field and I think that's really what at least in when I teach the U.S. survey the first half or the second half that's what gets students excited especially those students who will like, this will be their only history class ever when they actually read Ida B. Wells is like red record and they are put through all of that they have a much better understanding yeah. of what it means to study reconstruction in the Jim Crow South not just as citizens but like why we're talking about it in this way. And I, I think it's the same thing when you teach like uh, native writers or you know African-American writers who like convert to Christianity during like the first great awakening in the late 18th century or in the 19th century, their writing is very you know piercing and attempting to not just be critical patriots, but also to be, to po to be positive patriots and to share in the joy of being a part of this nation, right? Um, and that leads into my, Another question that I have is, I don't, I'm not sure if you go over this in your book because I've not read it yet, but what role does God or religion play in American patriotism? Mm. And has it always been negative or always been positive? I mean, obviously it's both because we're historians and the answer is always complicated, but like, <laughs> how, how do you understand the role that religion has played in defining not just American identity, but American patriotism? And just as a quick aside, the book is not out yet, so I, I would not expect you to have read it. It is out in okay. Um, But I do have, I will say to everybody, I have an electronic version that I'm happy to send by email if people are interested. We ain't in this for the, the money and fame, right? So, um, well, the fame is nice. This is nice fame, but the money part now. Um, but anyway, yes, um, I think religion is a double-edged sword. I think it is along both ends of the spectrum or both sides of this coin. Um, and so I think even just about like songs, for example. So. Uh, the Star Spangled Banner um, has these later verses that are not as well known, um, including the third one that talks about slavery that Colin Kaepernick has highlighted a lot over the years. Um, but the fourth verse of the Star Spangled Banner is kind of the first time that the phrase, in God we trust, is used. He doesn't say mm. the exact thing. He says, um, and this be our motto, in God is our trust, but same basic idea. And so that really helps to start the ball rolling on that kind of association of um, in God we trust, which gets put on money during the Civil War, kind of because of the Star Spangled Banner's uh, first version of it, and then God Bless America. And, those, and I think those ideas do really play into some of the more celebratory, mythic, and often exclusionary patriotism. But on the other end of that spectrum, if I think about songs, I think about the Battle Hymn of the Republic during the Civil War, uh, written by Julia Ward Howe, an abolitionist, an artist and poet and activist. And, and that song is as religious as any American song has ever been, His Truth is Marching On, et cetera. But also the last verse, which is also hardly ever performed, she explicitly says it's all about Christ as a kind of symbol of America or vice versa. And she says, as he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free. So she explicitly makes the sort of abolitionist goal of the Civil War into this kind of also the spiritual goal um, in a way that would really challenge any narrative that the Civil War wasn't about abolition, for example. Um, so I think, I think it's a double-edged sword. And those two songs sort of highlight the more kind of celebratory, God bless America kind of narrative, but also the possibility of, of religion becoming a part of this idea of active and critical patriotism, of pushing the nation towards something better that it wasn't at yet. So I think it can be both. So is, I've had two drinks. I'm gonna ask this <laughs> question. Um, and so, so we had um, uh, Sarah Posner and um, Kristen Kobitz's men's Dume um, on here who talked about kind of contemporary evangelicals and Christian nationalism in, in the 21st century. And so one of the things that, that you know, you're, what you've been talking about kind of has me thinking, like, I'm wondering if it's actually nationalism in the sense that um, uh, nationalism, at least as, as I kind of understand it, advances the cause of the nation, 
it might be a particularly narrow uh, jingoistic understanding of the nation, but it, it's something about kind of the, the, the nation state and kind of its 19th century, early 20th century kind of formation. But Christian nationalism today, at least as it's kind of advanced, um, you know, by the, the multitude of writing that, that's been going on right now, it advances kind of a world historical goal, right? It wants America to, 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 to become a godly nation in order to do X or Y, support Israel, bring on the apocalypse eventually, stuff like that. And so, so is that, like, is that term, does that term make sense there, the term nationalism within that kind of formulation? Is, is there a, is there some, is there, is there a form of it that, that exists beyond kind of what we think of as kind of the, the, the 19th century nation state? Yeah, I mean, I think it does in as much as to me that the, the exclusionary white supremacist narratives of America mm. have always been, at least to a degree, um, and, and this is partly why I wanna make sure we don't define them as the only possibilities, because sure. I think they aren't, they aren't ultimately about the best interests of our collective we, of we the people at all. Um, I think a really telling example of that is actually in the Confederate constitution, which ultimately becomes very much kind of a an influence on the, the next hundred years of American history, even though the Confederacy loses. Alexander Stevens, when he's describing that constitution in the Cornerstone speech in 1861, the vice president of the Confederacy, he says, you know, the cornerstone of this, of this nation is that, you know, is this hierarchy, is the idea that the African-American is subservient to the white, et cetera. And he's, we are the first nation in the history of the world to be based on that philosophy. Um, and I think a lot of white supremacist American uh, narratives sort of extend from that and try to be a continuation of a, na a, a nation, but based on a philosophy, based on an idea of white supremacy, of exclusion. To me, those are not ultimately in service of America, as I want to argue for it. Those are in service of white supremacy. They're in service of, of mm -hmm. these, these, I would say, broader philosophies. So I think that does parallel with kind of where some of that Christian nationalism is, too. It takes the idea of the nation, it utilizes it in this very limited way in service of an even bigger and even more overtly us versus them kind of narrative of either race or religion or whatever else. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it is nationalist in that sense, but it, okay. it's all the more reason to challenge it as the only way to be patriotic as an American. It certainly isn't that. Sure, yeah. okay, great. So I think we should move to, to Q and A. Um, we've we've reached the second half uh, part of the, uh, the 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 show here, and we have some some really great questions, and I hope uh, more people will um, um, be uh, be posting them as as we're talking them. So um, you know, one of the first one of the questions that was asked here, and, and I don't know if this is kind of outside of your wheelhouse, um, and, and but I'll take we're a swing. Ask it anyway. Is um, you know we were talking about textbooks earlier, and like have you looked at textbooks in this the, um, outside of the U.S. Like, is this the, the kind of formation of kind of a nationalist patriotic identity, this, this critical patriotism? Is, is it common elsewhere? Is it something unique to the United States in, in your, your research? Is the critical patriotism part or the- Or any, like, like how, do they, how do they talk about their nation's past? Like, do, are, they, are they interested in kind of the same ideological formation that, that American textbooks seem to be interested in? I mean, the educational, kind of uh, models that I have, have thought about outside of the US, and I'm definitely an, an Americanist um, in a lot of ways, and I wouldn't pretend not to be, but, but the, the models I've looked at are the way kind of authoritarian states use education. Because mm -hmm. I think a lot of the time America has moved in that direction. And I think right now we are, I mean, the whole proposal about patriotic education is completely an attempt to move us in that direction. Because that's what authoritarian states do is they take, you know, the starting point is the next generation is the most important generation to keep kind of within the frame of this authoritarian narrative. Um, this celebratory narrative, this the state is I kind of authoritarian leader narrative, all of it. So I think it's in the schools and the Hitler youth and these programs for kids that those kind of states kind of do their most consistent indoctrination because that's the most important step is kind of whatever the next generation is so they don't grow up thinking about resistance or critical patriotism or challenge. So that's what I've thought the most about is that side of the coin. I have to hope and I have to believe that in the more democratic uh, systems in the world, it's the opposite to at least a degree mm. that the goal of education is at least ostensibly to provide, again, multiple stories and, and texts and contexts and critical thinking opportunities. Fails at that, of course, as we do a lot of the time too, but that would be the goal of the sort of other end of the spectrum would be, it's to provide these skills that allow people to approach the subjects themselves. 
rather than to indoctrinate them into the existing narrative, the existing story. And I think that tension has been a part of America. There has been consistently one sort of set of ideas that, that education is about indoctrination. Look at the two different ways to think about the Pledge of Allegiance, right? The Pledge of Allegiance is written by a Christian socialist, Francis Bellamy, who wants it to be aspirational, like a critical patriotic goal of getting the nation to that place, to the republic for which it stands. But a lot of the time, the way it gets talked about is if you don't stand and do it, you're going to be kicked out of school. You're going to be punished. It's a little bit of indoctrination into a kind of allegiance without thinking. So I think even at that point, we've got these different models, these different ways to think about what education could be. And again, I think America right now is at a tipping point toward the possibility of a more authoritarian way to think about education. Hopefully we won't go down that road. But. Yeah. So building on that, um, Erica asked a really good question, and it's about myth, memory, and, you know, Confederate monuments, right, or statue or buildings that are named after Confederate leaders. You know, she says that she lives in a town that's being named after that, uh, and she teaches at a school that's named after Robert E. Lee, and they're currently grappling with changing the name or not. Um, I guess my question um, for all the naysayers out there, because they want to hear this question, are we, are we forgetting our, his our history? when we question not not the existence of these Confederate monuments, but like keeping them, like destroying them, right? Like, should they all be put in a museum or something, right? Like, how should we actually grapple with the memory of the Confederacy, given the fact that even right after the Confederacy is over, the United States, along with the Northern states, engage in a concerted effort to forget the Confederacy ever existed? Or I would, I, would, I would go even further, and I mean, I've argued at length that the Confederate narrative triumphs in the second half of the 19th century, not just forget it, but embrace it in a lot of ways. And that's what I would say. And I grew up in Charlottesville, so I'm knee deep in these questions all day, every day, um, okay. for at least the last three, four years. Um, you can't escape them in the context of Charlottesville, for sure. And, and to me, that's the key thing about the history is it's not, well, I guess like any historicizing and any memory building but really, really centrally in this case, that it is, it is a, a process that unfolds in a purposeful constructed way, right? Literally and figuratively constructed. Those Charlottesville statues are erected in 1921, right? They're not erected in 1866. They're not Civil War memory. They are Confederate memory in the early 20th century, like so many of these unfolding narratives are. So that, I mean, that's where I want to start is to say, okay, at the very least, until we recognize the actual history of how these things were built, constructed, named, evolved in a moment of national white supremacist endorsement of the Confederate narrative, then we're not actually engaging the history at all. And their presence was never engaging the history at all because it was a project. It was the project of embracing Confederate white supremacist narratives in the 1890s, in the 1920s, et cetera. So that's the starting point. We have to better understand the, the history of how they were created, when and how, how it happened and why. And then we can maybe start to talk genuinely about what we might do with them. I don't think they should be in public squares for that reason, among others, but we can then start to think about how we might uh, better remember them in context more mm. accurately. But for now, again, we haven't even begun. I mean, Charlottesville is a great example. So much of the time, those are talked about as Civil War statues. They're in 1921. They, they're as far from the Civil War as they are from 1980. I mean, they're, they're in the middle of the 20th century, basically. So they're not Civil War statues. They're 1920s white supremacist Confederate memory statues, as Adam Dombey and a lot of other people have written about so well. So if we start there, at least the conversation can proceed. How do we deal with these 1920s Confederate memory pieces rather than, you know, how are we dealing with, like, my great-grandfather who fought in the Civil War or something? That's a separate question, but it's not the question of those statues. It's definitely so I forget the name of the racist who ran against the current Virginia governor in 2018 or 2017. Right. Uh, but he's like uh, Ed, he's... Ed Gillespie, or, Corey or was Stewart. it Corey Stewart? Corey Stewart. Corey, sorry, yeah, Corey there Stewart. Are, uh, there are so many Virginia racist Republicans who have run for statewide office. Well, it, and it is in my defense. Let's be honest, and Democrats. Yeah. And Democrats. Time. Well, yeah, um, yes, yes, absolutely. But basically, uh, I think it was Corey Stewart before he lost the primary. He's like from Michigan or something, right? And like when he was running in the primary, he was like claiming heritage. And th I've seen this a lot, where like people who have never been to the South or never been to a former Confederate state or are like from the West, like Arizona or California, 
are obsessed with this Confederate heritage slash narrative. And it's really easy for me to, to say, yeah, this is all their racism because it, it probably is. But is there something deeper there that we should be worried about or at least attempt to explain in order to like move forward, right? Because one aspect is obviously the racism and the denial of slavery being a horrible institution and the civil war being about ending slavery. But is there something else there? about needing well, to just, claim this heritage. If I could add on a point, and I don't know if you, there was a big thing going around on Twitter today. It's just, this just emphasizes the point that Barsha is um, asking about is uh, the pictures of the, 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 the militia members, I'm sorry, the domestic terrorists who were arrested, all Confederate flags in <clears> their <throat> yards and stuff like that. So. Yeah, and they're in Wisconsin, right? Uh, Michigan, Michigan, or yeah. Michigan, like what? Michigan was never a part of the Confederacy. What is happening? Well, I've seen more Confederate flags in Massachusetts and New Hampshire than I see in Virginia when I go back to Virginia. So no, it is not, it's not anymore if it ever really was regional. And in some ways, of course, it, it, it never was. And I think that's really actually an opportunity to again, recognize sort of white supremacy as, as this national narrative. And I mean, I've, I've argued at length in a bunch of places that it's the late 19th century that really is the moment of the real deepening of that exclusionary white supremacist narrative on every national front, from first immigration laws to uh, the triumph of the lost cause narrative to a bunch of other factors, the anti-labor movement, activism, and all, all these different sides get pulled together into this kind of white supremacist exclusionary reinforcement and replication of that narrative way beyond maybe any place it had been previously. And I think we are still living in that moment in a lot of ways. We are still in the legacy of that moment. And so, I mean, make America great again, right? It's about a return to an imagined past that never existed, but is really potent. And that's what that all becomes, right? It's not, it's not about the actual Confederacy per se. It's about this imagined white supremacist paradise um, that the US was in this narrative at some point. And so I think the flag kind of really, to me, represents that. It represents people who are saying, I am afraid of what I perceive as changes, as what I perceive as, as these threats to parts of my identity that have always been here, but that are perceived as new and threatening and change. And so the Confederate flag is this easy symbol of that white supremacist, idealized, mythologized America. Not South at all, I don't think, America. I think it is a kind of alternate American flag. I think it kind of always has been in some ways, and it certainly has been ever since 1875 or so. Yeah. Um, so I, I want to change, change gears for a minute and come back to the, the question that initially kicked off this, this, this great conversation was about um, uh, the question from Erica about teaching in a school, right? And because one of the things that I think that we want to try to emphasize, and sometimes it gets buried here, is about the difference or, or the ways that K-12 educators kind of engage with this type of history. And so like going back to my question about kind of like, how do you teach this? Like, like what, how, how how do we help high school teachers? How do we help elementary school teachers like kind of push back or, or at least kind of think critically about what I take to be your, um, your discussion about kind of knowledge creation instead of kind of information conveyance. Like instead of just kind of making sure, which we, we recognize like people have to teach the test and all the standardized testing and this, this kind of the crap like this. But at the same time, like as Varsha pointed out, like the meat of history's primary sources, and it's not just reading them transparently, but knowing how to read them and, and bringing students along with you. So like, how do you, what is your advice to K-12 teachers? Um, well, first of all, thank you for your service to all of them. Um, now more than ever, now more than ever. My sons are in middle and high school. And I, I mean, uh, my job is tough right now, but their job is infinitely tougher. And it always has been, and it always will be. So, I mean, I'm not gonna pretend that I'm, I'm gonna, you know, I, I can only add my voice to the great work that is being done. But I mean, what I would say definitely is, I think that's really a place where I would try to make the case for a lot of what I make the case for in my writing as well, which is again, a middle ground or a way in between just the celebratory mythologized BS and the most critical kind of narratives, which are, are very hard to get into, into public education, into the classroom, into schools, in a lot of the country for sure, especially. Um, and so the middle of that to me, which is more close to the critical side, but it's a way of doing it, I think really successfully is recognizing that those are also the most inspiring American histories, right? You mentioned Ida B. Wells, Varsha. She is one of the couple most inspiring figures I've ever read about uh, in so many different ways in her life, in her work, in her activism. So it, it, it's not a matter of having to bring in just the sort of hardest, darkest 
most painful, most critical. She gets that stuff in there, but she's also a hero, right? Her picture should be on the top of an elementary school classroom. So should a Wei Mei Pass, as I mentioned. So should uh, Young Wing, this 19th century Chinese American figure who I really love as just an iconic American patriot. And like the best stories in American history, the best figures, the best voices are connected to this side, the critical patriotic side, the inclusive side. And they are inspiring and they are models and they are heroes that can be celebrated by everybody 100% of the time. So to me, it's not really about having to choose, although it feels it's presented that way. It's presented like it's either 1776 or 1619. But what if instead it's Elizabeth Freeman, again, in Massachusetts, and Frederick mm -hmm. Douglass, and the fact that Crispus Attucks was a fugitive slave. He ran away from slavery and spent 20 years uh, running away from slavery before he ended up on, on King Street for the Boston Massacre. Like The best stories in American history are inclusive ones, critical patriotic ones, ones that, re that reflect these different communities. So I think it is possible to bring those in, do justice to what you know maybe worried parents or worried school boards might want and still broaden so much beyond the kind of standard narrative. So that would be my main advice, I guess, is it's not either or. Yeah, I think fundamentally what you're saying, this is just me thinking out loud because it's so cool, is that patriotism is, all patriotism is constantly critical in that it is expecting that the United States or the country that you're a part of and patriotic about can always be better, right? And nationalism is assuming that it's already the best. And so, when you really want to be patriotic, you're reading the primary sources that just get you deep in the contradictions. And so the patriotism is in the contradictions, even though some of the negative aspects make you feel like, like crap, it's, it's about the contradictions that make you patriotic because they simultaneously want you to make the country better. And at the same time, give you a fuller picture of the story, right? So like, you know, if you're teaching Thomas Jefferson, don't just like make students read the Declaration of Independence Give, give them the text where he talks about slavery and basically justifies it to himself in this long, arduous text, right? And, give, and then give them, just as an example, give them this debate that he had with Benjamin Banneker, the African-American scientist and astronomer who writes back and forth with Jefferson about questions of race and identity. And, and Jefferson is, is he's having the conversation, but Banneker, I think, is winning the day for sure. So give them that text too. And then they are reminded, wait a second. Again, these are both founding fathers. These are both members of that generation. Um, and it doesn't mean, you know, just sort of tearing down Jefferson, complicating him, as you say, but then adding Banneker in, adding, adding these other figures in. And then yes, it is, it is about embracing both layers, the, or the multiple layers. But through that embracing, I mean, you know, I'm sure you guys know the James Baldwin quote, but it's the epigraph for my book. It's one of my favorites about critical patriotism when he says in Notes on a Native Son, um, I love America more than any country in the world. And precisely for this reason, I insist on the right to criticize her as fully as possible. Or I forget the last part of the quote, as, as, as constantly, to criticize her constantly. So it's both, right? It is that idea that there is something worth loving in this we, but that depends on the criticism that comes from knowing the contradiction. It comes from learning the histories and stories and then still arguing for that next step. Yeah. So, so what about uh, kind of combining a couple of questions that have been, that have been raised here. Um, so what about the history of class in America and, and specifically related to kind of patriotism? Like how is, how is that kind of played out? Like one of the things that, 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 that one of the commenters pointed out is, is about like, we're talking about the founding fathers, like that, that's, that's the land of the leap. Like right. oftentimes, except, except for someone like Benjamin Banneker, um, white landed elite, um, you know, so, so how does, how does kind of class function um, within this, this kind of history of nationalism and critical patriots, especially? And I think that's one reason why I so much want to make the case for protest as, as one of the deepest, most consistent forms of critical patriotism, mm. because protest doesn't depend in fact, it often explicitly is opposed to those kinds of power structures, right? That you can, there's a lot of these things, even publishing, even sharing your voice is a kind of privilege that not everybody has and not everybody has had. And that's all part of what we need to grapple with. And that's true of anything to an extent, but protest is one of those things that can be shared, that can be acted upon uh, without maybe some of those, those unnecessary privileges. And so if we think about protesters, if we think about protest communities, um, or, and, and, and those who are sort of acting upon that impulse. 
I think, as, as some of the most patriotic figures throughout our history. Again, it just opens up the possibility that a patriot can not only equally be, again, someone with none of that privilege or power, but more so, right? More consistently so, because often, again, those are the ones who are leading protest in a variety of forms today in 2020, for sure, and, and throughout our history. And, and again, I mean, just a great example of that for me is the Mashpee Revolt in Massachusetts, this, this Native American community that just rises up against a white settler aggression and the state powers um, and says, we are gonna be an independent town of our own in Massachusetts and demands it and writes a petition to the legislature demanding it. Um, uh, people go to prison, William A. Pest is with them, he goes to prison. Other leaders of that community go to prison, but they win, they get out of prison, they convince William Lloyd Garrison to write about their cause and they sway the state legislature and they succeed in mass is created as an independent town. And now it's under threat from the Trump administration, but what isn't. But, um, but I mean, that's an example of a moment of protest from a deeply powerless community in a lot of ways. Who, I mean, that's not just class that again gets to race and ethnicity. Those are often in my head about these things, yeah. but it is also about the idea of power and powerlessness. And, and those without power, again, have most frequently been to me the most critical patriotic communities because of that history of protest and activism and resistance to the power structure. So I think that's one way at least to open up the categories a bit. Okay, random question. So besides Apish, who do you think should have a biopic? made about them like if you were going to be a consultant about a, his, a movie about an american patriot and the title of the movie is called american patriot and it is not a patriot that you would generally consider oh yeah let's make a movie about this guy besides apish which you've talked a lot about and i should definitely read him oh boy that is a really good question and there's a long list of possibilities um I'm trying not to go with, you know, there's a lot who still need it, like a Frederick Douglass still needs a great biopic. Ida B. Wells needs a great one. Um, uh, Dolores Huerta in the 1960s and 70s. I mean, there's so many who come to mind, but I do, I mean, a figure who I do really love, and he's contradictory in a lot of ways, but is this guy Young Wing, this Chinese American um, educator and figure in the 19th century. He's the first Chinese American graduate from a, a university. Um, so he's elite in some ways, for mm -hmm. sure. But then he dedicates his life to trying to sort of build a Chinese American community that can bridge between both places and kind of embody that. And so he creates this school, this program in Connecticut called the Chinese Educational Mission, which is housed in Hartford, Connecticut in the 1870s, brings over other young men to be students in this and to have this kind of multinational experience. Um, during that time, he also gets married to a woman from Connecticut. They have two sons who kind of follow in his footsteps as educators and activists between China and the United States and his whole life. And then they all get affected by the Chinese Exclusion Act. He's forced out of the country for a time and his wife dies while he's out of the country. And his sons are, are sort of fostered off to other families, but then he finds his way back as I think an illegal immigrant. It's during an era when he's not legally allowed back into the country. But when he dies in 1910, his obituary in the New York Times says he dies at his home in Hartford. So I'm pretty sure he was in the US illegally at the end of his life as kind of one mm. of the first documented illegal immigrants in the early 20th century. His life is just an amazing window into these different sides. And amidst all of that, he volunteers for the Union Army during the Civil War. Um, he leads this campaign to get rid of the coolie trade, the trade in, in enslaved Chinese laborers. Just so many moments of, of patriotism, of activism, of educational ideas. He's, he's a figure who needs probably like a mini series, a, a, <laughs> an HBO, you know, eight episode kind of thing. Oh yeah, I'm I'm super. I want to see that, but I'm also super excited for the John Brown series. Yes, me too. Up. Me too. Uh, Ethan Hawke as John Brown is making me like. If ever there was a patriot who is critical but like also badass, it's John Brown. Okay, and crazy, but students, crazy in good ways for sure. Yeah, crazy in good ways. Okay, mm -hmm. and so not enough students like know about John Brown, and like I feel like that's one of the major failures of um of history education in America at all levels. Agreed. Yeah. Well, we're fortunate enough to live, well, I'm fortunate enough to live relatively close to Harper's Ferry and having been there a few times. I it's mean, it's so hard pretty. not to know about. And it's so pretty. Um, so, and um, if anybody's aware, um, so this is this is a show on Showtime called The Good Lord Bird. Showtime, feel free to contact us. We're happy for a sponsorship later on. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, it's based on a James McBride novel. Uh, the first episode, I think, is free actually on Amazon Prime if you have Amazon Prime right now. Um, and yeah, Ethan Hawke is, is really interesting. I mean, that's a really interesting character too. And I mean, I, uh, we could have a whole 
I could talk about John Brown for forever. But, um, you know, one of the things the McBride novel does is it really plays up, like Ben, you were saying about the crazy, yeah. right? Is, is um, you know, is, which again, that brings us back to this question of religion because it's the religious fervor, I think, which sometimes gets portrayed as kind of out of sorts, um, mm -hmm. which in the context of the 1850s, like not so out of sorts. Well, and, and, so, and not um, only that, and not only that, but again, you know, there's at least equal fervor in the sort of God bless America narrative um, and, and fervor in service of a cause that is much more contradictory to Christ and his teachings. So John Brown or the Battle Hymn of the Republic um, or Dorothy Day, who I really love, the Catholic yeah. social worker, are much more, I would say, in the spirit of, of the sort of best yeah. of taking Christianity and making it into a part of their social progressive yeah. ideas. Or again, Francis Bellamy, the guy who writes the, the Pledge of Allegiance, he was kicked out of two different churches as a minister because he was preaching against economic inequality in Boston and then racial segregation in Florida. And he gets kicked out as the minister in both cases because he won't stop preaching about those things because he's a Christian socialist and that's his core. So yeah. I think, you know, if those figures are extreme, they're at least extreme in the direction of both a progressive critical patriotic view and a Christ-like one in a way that would be worth examining. So can I can I ask for a little preview too? I mean, I don't I know the book's not out yet, but um, you know, since we're talking about this too, and, and this is a text that I, I love teaching with when I when I talk about religion and violence, honestly, is Lincoln's second inaugural, mm -hmm. which is it's it's an amazing text. And I think like it's one of those things that which which I like I grew up with like the the son of an American history teacher. Like I, I took all sorts of American I never read it. Like I knew it was important, but we never read it. And if you read it, like it's crazy, man. Like, it's just like, like Lincoln's like, beautiful. It makes everything. Like, you know, like when you see like um, girls who are like major Beatles fans, when I read <laughs> Lincoln's second inaugural, I was like, man, if I was there, like. We're running down the street, <laughs> screaming after him. And, <laughs> yeah. I'm picturing yeah. you now, Varsha, with like a, like a paste on like beard and a, and a exactly. stove top, uh, top height, That's right? Like, me. Yeah. Well, and okay. yeah, and I mean, I think Lincoln, who's a complicated figure like they all are, but he gave voice to those multiple layers of patriotism. I mean, the Gettysburg Address as well, yeah. as an embodiment yeah. of active patriotism saying, you know, they have already given, and now it is up to us to keep the work going, to keep doing the work, you know, in that incredibly short time to make that case for active patriotism to a non-soldier audience. I mean, he's saying to the rest of America, it's our job. It's our job to do that work. It's our job to finish that effort. Um, so I think he gave voice to the active patriotism, to the critical patriotic side at times for sure, as well as any individual voice. And I think that's partly why, again, even for people who don't recognize it, that's partly why those texts echo so well, because they're not just the usual presidential BS of you know, God bless the United States of America, et cetera. He, uh, he could do that, but he also could layer in those other sides too. This is the work we have to do. And this is why the work is vital. And this is how the work is unfinished. And this is why it, it might fail and why we might deserve the worst, but why we have to give everything we have to not giving into that. I mean, he gave voice to all those sides in a really powerful way. For sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, 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 and so concisely he too, did. right? I mean, yeah. that's, that's the amazing thing about if you actually read the Gettysburg Address or the second inaugural. Yeah, they're like three paragraphs long, yeah. No, it's, yeah, yeah, it's just like, yeah, it's kind of amazing. So. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Sadly, we're um, out of time. Yeah. But do you have another question? Um, I, I mean, I think we have a whole bunch of questions, but unfortunately they're going to take us down really long roads and we just, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't yeah. want to get into that. So, um, yeah. Well, email, ahead, paraphrase. Well, yeah email, email Ben, buy his book when it comes out in January, um, you know, well, register to vote. You know, however, however you're voting, register to vote. Um, and, you know, to paraphrase Lincoln, you know, with malice towards none, with charity for all, you know, with firmness in the right, uh, cheers. And a fighting spirit like Modelo. I did finish it. I did finish the movie. <laughs> uh, there was a recommendation next time, Ben, for Modelo uh, Negra. Negra. Better Good version. To know. So. Good to know. Yeah. Good to there you go. There you go. Um, so, yeah, but uh, let me echo Varsha. Cheers, everyone. Have a great Friday. We'll see you um, in two weeks. We're going to take next week off, but we'll see you in two weeks. See you soon.